Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Jesus said, Sin no more. Not sin less, or commit smaller sins. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Christ said that to a man. In John chapter 5, he said the same thing to a woman. In John chapter 8, the woman taken in adultery, he said, Go and sin no more. Not go and sin less. The only sin on weekends. Go and sin no more. God has no interest in sin of any kind or any size. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. And be glad in it. Let me clarify. God made seven days. He only blessed one. And the Bible says, what God has blessed, no one can unbless. You see, you can't take the blessing of one day and arbitrarily put it on another day. Only God can bless. And what God blesses, you cannot unbless. Now listen carefully. What God curses, <laughs> you cannot uncurse. How are you? You're not sure? Are you well? It's nice to see you. Thank you very much. It's uh, 16 after 11. I'll release you by 12. Is that okay? Say yes, please. All right. I don't like long sermons, although I have preached them before. I try to forget them. But uh, I believe you want to be released quickly, and I will try to do that. I saw some hands when my elder asked, who is with us for the very first time? Would you raise your hands again, please? First time. All right. Would you give us your name, please? Donna. Donna. Thank you for coming, Donna. God bless you. Did I see your hand? Andrew. Good Bible name. He was the younger brother of Peter. Andrew, thank you for coming God bless you. What other hand did I see? Mine, Joe. Didn't I see yours? Yes. No. Your hand. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Is it Joe or Joseph? Joseph. Joseph. That's the earthly father of Jesus. Joseph, good to see you. Thank you very much for coming. I say that on behalf of everyone who is a member of this church. Did I see a hand in the other row? What's your name? Hmm? Justina. Who? Justina. 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 Jaspina. Jaspina. Just spell it for me. D-E-S-P-I-N-A. What? T-E-S? Tespina. D. Oh, Despina. Ah, I have sinned. Forgive me. God bless you. Thank you for coming, my lovely sister, Despina. Anyone else? You're here for the first time. All right. Let's say amen for our guests. Amen. Come on, that was weak. Say it again. 
One more time. God is good. And all the time. How many of you really love God? Can I see your hand? Ah, God bless you. God is such a nice person. I like him a lot. I really do. He's a nice person. I told you the first day I stood, or the second day, as I look at my life, all my blessings have come from God. God has never done me anything wrong. All my problems, I own myself, and I have a copyright for them. All my problems. Are you with me? But all my blessings have come from God, and I thank God publicly that he has always been good to me, and nothing other than good. For those online, thank you very much for joining us. May God bless you super abundantly as you join us in worshiping God. How? In spirit and in truth. Most people prefer to worship God in spirit and leave out the truth. Because truth is often inconvenient. Are you following me? But Jesus told us in John 4.24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must. The word is must worship him in spirit and in truth, which means the person worshiping God with only one is not worshiping God. Now, if you're worshiping God in spirit and not in truth, it's the wrong spirit. You know why? Because this Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. If you're worshiping God in truth, you have the right spirit. God wants both. All right. Our subject, buildings without foundations. What did I say? <laughs> buildings without foundations. I always ask, let me double check on my own behalf, that this phone is turned off. These smartphones, they do everything except forgive your sins. <laughs> these phones. <laughs> Make sure they're turned off so that there's no disturbance in the house of God. We must always give God reverence. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, Put your words in that man's mouth. Because we all have a carnal nature, we like to exalt ourselves. That's a carnal nature. It's a tremendous temptation for any preacher, for anyone who stands in front of people. And so you tell God, put your words in that man's mouth. Because my words cannot save you. They may impress you. They cannot save you. But the words of God will change your lives. The words of God will bring back your child who left the church. The words of God will heal that broken relationship. The words of God will turn your enemy into your friend. Ask God to put his words in my mouth. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Those are the words I want to speak. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we acknowledge you as God and God alone. We come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior, your Son, the Creator. We come also, Father, because there's no other place we can go to get help. As we bow in your divine presence, if we have sinned, forgive us, God. With your forgiveness, give us power to overcome. With your forgiveness, give us hatred for sin and a restless love for righteousness. Bless us as we worship you through the word. Use me, God. Tell me what to say, when to say it. And how to say it. Grant me the humility of Christ, but also his boldness. Bless our guests in a very special, sweet way. Bless their lives and all members of their families. Bless those online. Bless all countries represented by those watching right now. But particularly, bless the, country, the government of this country, the host country. Guide their decisions, Father. Remind them somehow that righteousness exalteth a nation. Amen. Bless the sick. Remove COVID-19 from anyone who may have contracted it, Father. Ease suffering, dear God. Remove agony. Give us health. Amen. Now, Father, I commit this service to your glory. Bless us with the revelation of yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say, 
Amen and amen. What's our subject? Buildings without foundation. Let us go to Daniel chapter 2, chapter 3, sorry. We'll read from verse 1. Daniel 3, reading from verse 1, and I read from the King James Version of the Bible. It's already 1125. I said I'll let you go by 12. I may have to go to 10 after, but I'll let you know if I need that extra 10 minutes. What book did I say? Yeah. What chapter? Three. Reading from what verse? Three. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes and the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the princes, governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You will find the expression that Nebuchadnezzar had set up about three times in that passage, I believe. Let's read it again. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Now, while that doesn't say set up, it means the same thing. Are you with me? He made it, he set it up. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, that's one time. Whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes and the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So that's really five times. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything, that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Commandment to forbids us from making images and worshipping images. You see, an image is made by man. All of our gods are man-made. But the true God made man. Ah, I lost you. It's my fault. Let me try again. All false gods are man-made. Are you with me? The true God made man. God said, do not make images. Don't worship them. Don't bow down to them. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Violation of commandment two. Now let's go to verse four of Daniel three, our subject. Buildings without foundation. Then an herald cried aloud. To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Now, this herald cried aloud to all people, nations, languages. Remember now, Babylon was the most powerful nation in the world back then. Now, when you talk about the world in the Bible, it means the world of the Bible. Are you with me? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Amen. The Bible doesn't know about Japan. Are you with me? Or Argentina? Or whomever, North Korea? When the Bible talks about the world sometimes, it refers to the world of the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was the dominant kingdom in the world of the Bible. So that's the world. So when you read verse 4 of Daniel 3, 
Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, this command applied to all those under the control, the power, and the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. If that's clear, say amen. So it's a sort of a worldwide proclamation. And what's the proclamation? Worship that image. Which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. In other words, I want you to worship a man-made structure. What's our subject? Anything man-made will eventually come down. Even churches. Are you following me? Anything man-made will eventually come down. Let me show you what I mean, particularly when that thing is in opposition to God. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Our subject, buildings without foundations. Malachi 1, reading from verse 1. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. If you find Matthew, go one book before Matthew. Do you have Malachi chapter 1, reading from verse 1? What's our subject? Buildings. Buildings without foundations. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his what? Mountains as his heritage, waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now read verse 4 carefully. Whereas Edom said, now Edom is another word for Esau. Are you with me? Whereas, the word Edom means red. And when Jacob was making that porridge back in Genesis 25, it was red. Esau said, give me some of that porridge. The Bible says, therefore was his name called Edom. That's where he got the name from, because he fell in love with this red porridge. Whereas Edom saith, Malachi 1 verse 4, we are impoverished, but we will return and do what? Build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Read with me now. They shall build. Come on but I will throw down. Stop. Hmm. You can build a Burj Khalifa. Where is that? In uh, Dubai, is it? That tall building, the tallest in the world? A quarter of a mile high? God says, you can build. Finish my words. I will throw down. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these words of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now that's a different kind of building. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and, and, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock, and that rock is truth. Are you following me? And Jesus is truth. And whosoever heareth these words of mine, or these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, he shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon what? The sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. It collapsed, it crashed. It was a building, finish my words, without foundation. Some people build lives not on Christ. The principles by which they live their lives are not founded in Scripture. That life is a building, come on, tell me, without foundation. It will crash. Jesus said, when you hear my word, build your life on this rock. What you build will not fall. You see, it won't be a physical building. It will be the character of Jesus Christ. Are you following me? And the character of Christ does not collapse. And so we go back to Daniel 3. Verse 4. Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue speaking Restrain me, remind me my purpose in this desk is your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso worshipeth not shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, nations, languages fell down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. What do we have? Most of the world back then worshiped the image. Most people do what is wrong. When the flood came, Genesis 7, how many people were saved? Out of the population of a world. Most people do. What is wrong? Even though God has provided ample opportunity for them to do what is right. This is the condemnation, says Christ. That light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light. All the people, the nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Verse 9, they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree. In other words, the government has made a law. Now, the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, don't take that to mean you ought to be rebellious against the government. It simply means whenever a law is contrary to God's law, we follow God. Can you say amen? amen? Regardless of who the opposing power is, anything that violates, thus saith the Lord, we follow God and we suffer the consequences. Verse 10, Thou, O king, hath made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, should fall down and worship the golden image that thou hast set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. They remind the king of what he said. Verse 12. There are certain Jews <laughs> whom thou hast set over the affairs of the kingdom of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let me read that again. There are certain Jews. Not all. Not all. A few. Shadrach, Meshach, or I prefer to call them by the Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are names built upon Babylonian gods. So I prefer Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. There are certain Jews. Let me pause on that. There are certain people in the city who will not drink. They will not smoke. They will not gamble. They will not go along with the immorality of society. There are certain people in Haman who are determined to honor God, but they're just a few. There are certain people in the church who are determined to be faithful to the teachings of the church based on thus saith the Lord. In every situation, there's always, there's, there are certain people, always a few. There are certain parents who make it the, the, the concerted effort to raise their children properly and not let them run around wild. There are certain people, not many, just a few. There are certain men who realize it is my spiritual responsibility to stand and be a priest. There are certain men. There are certain young people who say, I will not engage in premarital sex. Just a few. There are certain preachers who say, I will preach what God says and keep my opinions to myself. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, hath not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 13. Then they brought these men before the king. 
Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true, the rumor I heard? Do we not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Is it true? Now, if ye be ready, verse 15, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalmody, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, good for you. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Finish verse 15 for me. Who is that God? <laughs> mm. Who? Who will you call for backup? When I've got you in my fist, my governmental fist, my fist of authority, who is that God that can get you out of my iron fist? Go to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus 5, let's read from verse 1, our subject, building without buildings, without foundations. Do you have Exodus 5? We read from verse 1. As always, I always invite you, if you don't mind, you have my version. Read with me. What does that say? And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and did what? Told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. What did they say? Let my people go that they may do what? Hold a feast unto me, where? In the wilderness. Now, this wasn't Moses or Aaron speaking. Who was speaking? God. Aaron was just God's mouthpiece. By the way, it was always Aaron speaking, not Moses. That's just an aside. Moses would tell Aaron what to say, and Aaron would talk to Pharaoh. But maybe I'll show you that some other night. Look at verse 2. Read for me, and? Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Stop. What did Nebuchadnezzar say to those boys? Who is the Lord? Who is this God that can get you out of my hand? Pharaoh, hundreds of years earlier, said, Who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice, come on, to let Israel go. I know not the Lord. Finish the verse. Neither will I let Israel go. People who don't know God make some risky decisions, some life-threatening decisions. And when Pharaoh found out who God was, it was too late. God started sending plagues on that man's country. Not out of spite, but for a couple of reasons. One, to let him know, this is the God you don't know. Let me introduce myself. I'll turn all the water to blood. You're not convinced about me, I'll bring frogs on your land. You're not convinced, I'll bring lice. Not convinced, I'll bring flies. Not convinced, I'll bring marine. Not convinced, I'll bring boils. Not convinced, I'll bring locusts. Not convinced, I'll send hail. Not convinced, I'll send doctors. Not convinced, I'll kill all your firstborn. Now, do you know who I am? By the way, let me speak on God's behalf. God did not want to send any plagues. You see? That's why he told Moses and Pharaoh, go and tell him. Let my people go. Let's apply that to us. There are some people who are determined not to obey God. And God sends one little hardship to do this. Wake up. You're opposing me. You continue this path, it'll get worse and worse. I'm sending this trial to catch your attention. And we ignore God. Then God sends another one a little worse. Then he has to send another one because some people are determined to show God how bad they are. I'm bad. <laughs> well, I can't say God is bad, but you understand what I mean. You're bad, God is badder. Are you with me? You can't come up in God's face and expect to survive. So Pharaoh said, Who is this God? I don't know him. I won't let Israel go. Nebuchadnezzar said, Who is this God? They shall deliver you out of my hands. In chapter 4, God showed him. Because he said in verse 29 and 30 of chapter 4, Is this not great Babylon that I have built? And he showed off and he took all the credit. And God struck him down. For seven years he lived as an animal. Then he understood who God was. 
my brothers and my sisters, let's get back to Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, verse 16, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, what are the next few words? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> our God whom we serve. God is not an ATM machine where you go and get whatever you like when you're short on cash and then you say thanks and walk away. The, the, the three boys said, our God whom we serve. Give me another word for serve. Obey. This is critical. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. I love verse 18. Read for me. But if not, stop. Stop. Even if God doesn't bless me, based on what I know of him, I'll serve him. Can you say amen? amen. What did Job say? Though he slay me, come on, yet will I trust him. When God was wrestling with Jacob in Genesis 32, God touched his thigh and one leg was useless. Here's a man fighting God with one leg. He wouldn't let go. He might have said, God, you can put the other leg out of joint. I'm not letting you go. You've got to kill me. Are you with me? Those three boys said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Let me talk to the young people who are listening online in person. One of the reasons why your friends are so successful in getting you to do what's wrong, you do not make it known to them what you stand for. And it applies to the older people as well. Listen to what those boys said in verse 18. But if not, even if God does not deliver us, be it known unto thee, O king, we want you to know. We're not, get, we're not bowing. You can pull that trigger. Swing that sword, shoot that arrow, throw that hand grenade. We are not bowing. That's not rudeness. That's taking up a position on God's side. Can you say amen? I, am not, I don't work on Sabbath. I don't steal. I'm not saying I'm holier than you. I just don't steal. And I want you to know that so you don't waste your time trying to get me to join you in robbing a bank. I do not steal. When people realize that we don't or we do, they leave us alone. Hmm? When Naomi told Ruth, go back after your sister-in-law, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from falling after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, there will I be buried. And, and, she's not, and she's, when the Bible says, when Naomi saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she stopped talking to her. Let me say it again. A lot of times, we're bothered by the devil because we have not yet shown the devil, you got to kill me, I'm not doing that. The devil doesn't have time to waste. He knows he has what? A short time. If he knows he's butting his head against a wall with you, he goes to somebody else. But too often we let the devil see, I think you have a chance with me. Because I'm a little wishy-washy on my standards. So you have a chance with me. And he knows that, so he comes or he sends his angel. But when, like those three Hebrew boys, we say, no way. It goes off. Our friends say, leave us alone. There's a story that was told many years ago to me. I was in a certain country that had been ruled by a dictator for about 10 years. And the, the soldiers of this during that time would come to people's houses, abduct their daughters and do all sorts of things. And they, were, they, they had outlawed um, Adventists, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So they came one night, you know, checking on who were Adventists. And they came to one house and any Adventists? They said no. The soldiers said, what about that house? Any Adventists? They said yes, he's an old man. But don't waste your time, because nothing you do will change him. 
They told us, don't waste your time with your rifles and your, your bayonet. Nothing you do will change that man. You have to kill him. And they went to the house. And when they realized what the neighbor said was true, they just left the guy and went somewhere else. He, he made it clear to them, you kill me. I'm keeping the Lord's Sabbath. Kill me. I'll study his word. Kill me. I obey God. Back to Daniel 3.18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. My brothers and sisters, the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up came down. The faith of those boys will last forever. And one day, if you and I are faithful, we will see them. That which is based on thus saith the Lord never falls. It cannot fall because thus saith the Lord is in, real, in a very real way Jesus Christ himself. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, the Holy Spirit is truth. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, God is truth. If God is truth, Christ is truth, the Holy Spirit is truth, he or she who builds his life on truth is building his life on a divine foundation. And that life cannot fall. It can be attacked. It will not fall. With the rest of us who are determined to live our lives the way we choose and to allow man-made principles to guide our decisions, we are like Edom that said in Malachi 1 verse 4, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, come on, tell me, but I will throw down. Whatever is built and is not built on God will come down. My brothers and sisters, let me be more specific. Nebuchadnezzar said, break the second commandment. That's what he said. Effectively, that's what he said. If anyone tells you, worship an image, the person is telling you, violate commandment two and, of course, commandment one. Because whatever we worship is our God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 8, go there with me. You know it, but go there with me. Exodus 20, verse 8, while you're searching, I'll pray again. Fathers, I continue, speak clearly through me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I hope my online friends are still with us. Do you have Exodus chapter 20 from verse 8? If you have my version, say it out loud. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That was set up by God. The seventh day is the Sabbath. It was not set up by Seventh day Adventists. It was not set up by Seventh day Baptists. There are various religions that observe the seventh day. It was not set up by the Jewish nation. It was set up by God. And what God sets up, no man can overthrow. Now we have something called Sunday worship. That goes back to 321 AD when Constantine passed a law that all those in the city should stop working, close their shops, and rest on the day of the sun because sun worship was so widespread. In honor of the day of the sun. In honor of a God that is not the high God. Are you with me? Let us set up this day. Now the Bible says, thou sh don't worship any image. Whether it reflects something in heaven or on earth. When God told Moses to build a tabernacle, it was built in such a way the orientation of the tabernacle was when a sinner came in with a lamb, the sinner's back was toward the sun. Are you with me? The sinner's back was toward the sun, 
symbolizing I turn my back on the most common form of worship back then, which is sun worship. So as he entered the veil representing Christ, his back was to the sun. By the way, there's a hymn that says, when I fall on my face, with, on my knees with my face to the rising sun. You know those words? Unbiblical. Unbiblical. Your face should not be to the rising sun. It should be to that altar of sacrifice. Are you following me? Uh, Constantine said, rest on the first day, not on the seventh. And the empire began to do it. A few decades later, the church passed a rule. Canon 29, in the Council of Laodicea, anyone who keeps the seventh-day Sabbath is anathema. You know what anathema means? Anathema? Condemned. You're on the fast track to hell. Now, here's a church <laughs> telling people, if you obey God, you're on the fast track to hell. But if you obey Constantine, you're on the fast track to heaven. Sunday, as a day of worship, has no biblical foundation. It is a doctrinal building without foundation. It will come down. Here's what will happen to the Sabbath. Go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. It's... Uh, 5 to 12. What did I say? I let you go. 12. We'll see what happens. I won't be excessive. What book did I say? Isaiah. What chapter? Reading what verse? 22 and 23. This chapter talks about the new world, the new life. When Jesus Christ changes his old world and sets up the brand new world. Remember the Bible says, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Christ is coming back to destroy this whole earth and build a new one. I hope you understand that. Amen. Isaiah is prophesying about that. Here's what he says, verse 22, read with me. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I will remain before me, so shall your seed come on and your name remain. Isaiah says, speaking for God, the same way the new heaven. And the new earth which I will make shall remain. Why? Because the first ones did not remain. Are you with me? So the Bible is saying this new heaven, this new earth, this one will remain how long? Forever. And that's how long you will remain, says God. You see? Now, in the context of the new world, let's read verse 23. Now you read it for me. And it shall come to pass, come on. One new moon to another. Uh -huh. And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. That structure of the seventh day Sabbath will never fall. You know why? Because God set it up. Not a church. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I'm looking at the clock. I'm very time conscious. When you're a preacher, always believe that people don't like what you're saying, so cut it short quickly. If you assume they enjoy it, you're heading for trouble. Genesis 2, let's read from verse 1. Let me show you, no church set up the seventh-day Sabbath. It does not belong to a church. Verse 1, Genesis 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Read with me now. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why? Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, the seventh day Sabbath was instituted where? at creation in the Garden of Eden, and there was no church. And there were no Jews, or Baptists, or Lutherans, or atheists, by the way. Are you with me? God set this thing up. The Sabbath is not a creation of a church. It's the creation of God. Sunday is a day of worship. Notice I said, now God made the first day of the week, but not as a day that's holy. The, reality, the, the, the belief that Sunday is a holy day, that was set up by man. The Bible says we ought to obey God, come on, talk to me, rather than man. So we ought to observe the Sabbath rather than? Come on, why are you whispering? We ought to obey the? Rather than? Why? Because God set up the Sabbath. Yeah. 
Sunday is built on a foundation of sand. What does Jesus say? Anything built on sand is coming down. What did God tell Edom? They shall build, but I will throw down. Because they're building without foundation. My brothers and my sisters, no matter how entrenched a tradition is, it does not make it truth. It's very difficult to get that through to some. You know, I, uh, <laughs> those of us in the United States, when the United States loses a basketball game in the Olympics, we get dizzy. <laughs> because that's not supposed to happen. Are you following me? It's just not supposed to happen. Hmm? Now, <laughs> you tell some people Sunday is not the Sabbath and they get dizzy. What? But that's what most people do. I used to, I was uh, uh, passing a little church in an area called Highland Park, right outside Detroit. We were renting from a church. So every Sabbath morning, we'd go and set up the banner on the fence of the church, uh, Highland Park, SDA, Mustard Seed SDA Church, service 9.30 and Wednesday night and main service 11 on Sabbath morning. So one Sabbath morning, myself and the deacon were setting up the, the banner on the fence, and this man came across the street. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, we're advertising our services. He said, today? We said, yes. He said, why today and not tomorrow? <laughs> I said, well, the same day is the Sabbath. He said, I never knew that. He spoke for millions of people. Oprah Winfrey was interviewing a young man who was an Adventist. You can go on YouTube and look for it. And she said to him, why don't you work on the Sabbath? The guy works in Hollywood. He said, well, the seventh day is a Sabbath. You know what Oprah Winfrey said? I never knew that. There are people, despite the clarity of God's word, who have no clue. God's Sabbath is a seventh day. Notice I said, God's Sabbath is a seventh day. The seventh day has 24 hours like the first. The seventh day has evening and morning like the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. The only difference is, God blessed it. He didn't add any hours to it. He just blessed it. It's 12 o'clock. Give me 10 more minutes. Say yes. All right. Let's observe the six days of creation. Are you with me? What was made on the first day? Can you see light? Yeah. So it appeals to one of your senses. Are you with me? Which sense? The sense of sight. All right. What was made on the second day? The firmament. Can you see the open firmament? Yes. It also appeals to your sense of sight. What was made on the third day? Oh yeah, dry land separated from the water. Can you see the water? Yes. You bathe in it? Yes. You swim in it? Yes. You walk in the dry land? Yes. You plant the land? Yes. It appeals to your senses. You can smell the vegetation when the rain falls. You can feel the wind. You can see the birds. It appeals to the senses. Therefore, what was made? Sun, moon, and star. Can you see them? Do you feel the sun at noonday during the summer? Yes. And you look for shade and air conditioning? Yes. At night, do you see the stars? Yeah, you wish it weren't so cloudy, you can see all the stars. They appeal to your senses. So using your senses, you can say, yes, okay, he might have made the stars on the fourth day. Day five, what was made? Birds and fish. You have an aquarium in your house. Hmm? You go fishing, you catch it, throw it back with a cook in its mouth. Huh? You do all that sort of stuff. Are you with me? You see the fish, you love to see them swim, except the shark. You see the birds, are you with me? You love to see them fly. You love to see the hummingbird in your backyard. They appeal to the sense. What was made on the sixth day? Land animals. You have a dog? You have a cat? Some people keep an iguana, whatever you keep for pets. Huh? Do you see, you see the, whatever? You see the animals? They appeal to senses. We touch them. We hear them. We enjoy them. Sixth day. Also, human beings made six day. We have relatives. Fine. Now, on the seventh day, the Bible says, God blessed it and sanctified it. Can you see the blessing? No. Today's the Sabbath. Yes or no? Yes. Show me the blessing. <laughs> show me the blessing. Well, yeah, yeah, but uh, show, me, show me the blessing itself, not those benefiting from the blessing. Show me the blessing. Where is it? Can't see it. 
Show me the sanctification. The Sabbath appeals to faith. Are you following me? When God says the Sabbath is holy, you have to believe it without seeing anything. You believe it just because he said so. But he also said so when he said, let there be light. Are you with me? He also said so when he said, let the earth bring forth grass. He said so every day. On the seventh day, he said, this day is blessed. And you have no visual evidence, nothing that appeals to your five senses. You've got to rise higher. And that's the sense of faith. Amen. Sabbath keeping is an act of faith. Because you don't see anything. You don't smell the blessing. You don't feel it. You don't taste it. You simply accept it is blessed because God said so. Yeah, yeah. Now, Constantine said, the first day is the Sabbath. <laughs> okay. What has Constantine created with his word? Hmm? You look around, you see what God created with his word. So you can trust the word of God. What did Constantine's word create? Nothing. So here's God. Remember the seventh day, keep it holy, the Sabbath. Here's Constantine, remember the first day. Whom do you choose? Because God's word is a building that will never fall. Truth does not collapse. It may fall, it may fail to convict you or you or me, but it does not collapse. The word of the Lord endureth, come on, forever. Anything different from thus saith the Lord is a building without foundation. Nebuchadnezzar made that kind of image. His kingdom fell. Are you with me? You see, in chapter 2, God gave him a dream of an image, but the image had four different kinds of precious metals. Gold, silver, brass, uh, iron, iron, and clay. When Nebuchadnezzar found out the head of gold represented his kingdom, he realized his kingdom would pass away and the brass would take over, the silver would take over. So he decided in chapter 3 to set up his own image. Are you following me? But this time, his image was made of what? From top to? Meaning what? My kingdom will last forever. But that's not truth. And so in 539, the, 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 the Medes and the Persians came in and conquered Babylon. It fell. God said, it will pass away. Nebuchadnezzar said, it's going to stay. God said, okay, let a few decades pass. It fell. It was a building without foundation. My brothers and sisters, are you building your lives on this? If you're not, I speak with respect, you're building on sand. And whatever you build will collapse. Truth. Thus saith the Lord. That's the foundation. And Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. What is one of the sayings of Jesus? Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. What is one of the sayings of Jesus? Thou shalt not kill. What's one of the sayings of Jesus? Thou shalt not steal. What's one of the sayings of Jesus? Forgive one another. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, not Nebuchadnezzar, or President Biden, God bless him, or Trump, or Obama, or Putin, or forgot the guy's name in England, God bless him, the words of mine. I will liken him to a man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. Every house that's built must be subject to the rains, the wind, and the flood, trials and tribulations. The only houses that will not collapse are the ones built upon the rock of truth. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar's house, it fell. Pharaoh's house, it fell. The Medo-Persian house, it fell. The Roman house lasted over 600 years, it fell. The ten kingdoms are falling. And one day, the stone cut out without hands will smite the image 
upon the feet of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then shall the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, Daniel 2.35, be broken to pieces together and will become as the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind shall carry them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image shall become a great mountain that fills the whole earth. God's kingdom and that which he builds will last how long? Forever. And he wants us to be a part of that building. Are you with me? That's why he tells us symbolically in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, we're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. If you're part of the structure of Christ, and Christ will never fall, in Christ you can never fall. Build your lives on truth. Are you with me? And truth is not what you find in the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica has facts. There's a difference between facts and truth, saving truth. It is a fact that most people love to sin. That's not saving truth. Are you following me? It is a fact that about I don't know, 6 million Jews were killed in World War II. That's a fact. It's not saving truth. It is a fact. There was something called the slave trade. 13 million or however perish. That's not saving truth. It is a fact that uh, the hillside strangler killed so many women. That's not saving truth. Fact and truth are not the same thing. We're talking about truth because truth ultimately is a person. And that person is Christ. And Christ is God. And God will last forever. Build your lives upon God. Build your lives upon Christ, who is truth. Because the house built on Christ will withstand the rain, the wind, and the flood. It will never fall. It will continue right in the world to come. I call upon you in the name of Jesus. Make a decision right where you are. Say, Father, help me to build my life upon the rock of truth, Christ Jesus himself. How many will make that decision with me or reconfirm it? May I see your hand. Stand up with me. 10 after 12, thank you for your patience. Buildings without foundations. Hmm. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you today, God, that despite the passing of time, decades, anything not built upon you will eventually crumble and fall. We thank you, Father, for the frightening reminder, they shall build, but I will throw down. We thank you for the reminder, dear Father, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. We have so many reminders of crashed kingdoms and collapsed houses, dear God. They were not built upon truth. But Father, you're an individual God. By that I mean you care about us as individuals and you want each individual life to be a little building that's founded upon Christ. We've stood to say, we want by your grace to build our lives upon Jesus Christ. Because other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, dear God, as we prepare to leave this place, let your spirit go with us, dear God. Let the spirit wrestle with the person who even now might be resisting the words of truth that he or she heard. If that person submits, that person will be glad. Bring us back at six this evening, Father, to hear your word again. Bless all those who listened online, dear God. Do a similar work of transformation in their lives. And Father, when you come, May you find us by the grace of Christ as buildings standing firmly upon our Savior. Take us home, I pray, in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen.